Chapter 23 If there is any life that is happier than the life we led on our timber ranch for the next two or three weeks, it must be a sort of life which I have not read of in books or experienced in person. We did not see a human being but ourselves during the time, or hear any sounds but those that were made by the wind and the waves, the sighing of the pines, and now and then the far-off thunder of an avalanche. The forest about us was dense and cool. The sky above us was cloudless and brilliant with sunshine. The broad lake before us was glassy and clear or rippled and breezy or black and storm-tossed according to nature's mood. And its circling border of mountain domes clothed with forests, scarred with landslides, cloven by canyons and valleys and helmeted with glittering snow fitly framed and finished the noble picture. The view was always fascinating, bewitching, entrancing. The eye was never tired of gazing, night or day, in calm or storm. It suffered but one grief, and that it was it could not look always, but must close sometime in sleep. We slept in the sand close to the water's edge, between two protecting boulders, which took care of the stormy night winds for us. We never took any paragoric to make us sleep. At the first break of dawn, we were always up and running foot races to tone down excess physical vigor and exuberance of spirits. That is, Johnny was, but I held his hat. While smoking the pipe of peace after breakfast, we watched the sentinel peaks put on the glory of the sun and followed the conquering light as it swept down among the shadows and the captive crags and forests free. We watched the tinted pictures grow and brighten upon the water till every little detail of forest, precipice, and pinnacle was wrought in and finished, and the miracle of the enchanter complete. Then to business, that is, drifting around in the boat. We were on the north shore. There the rocks on the bottom were sometimes gray, sometimes white. This gives the marvelous transparency of the water a fuller advantage than it has elsewhere on the lake. We usually pushed out a hundred yards or so from shore and then lay down on the thwarts in the sun and let the boat drift by the hour whither it would. We seldom talked. It interrupted the Sabbath stillness and marred the dreams the luxurious rest and indolence brought. The shore all along was indented with deep curved bays and coves bordered by narrow sand beaches and where the sand ended and the steep mountainsides rose right up aloft into space, rose up like a vast wall, a little out of the perpendicular, and thickly wooded with tall pines. So singularly clear was the water, that where it was only twenty or thirty feet deep, the bottom was so perfectly distinct that the boat seemed floating in the air. Yes, where it was even eighty feet deep, every little pebble was distinct, every speckled trout, every hand's breadth of sand. Often as we lay on our faces, a granite boulder as large as a village church would start out of the bottom, apparently, and seem climbing up rapidly to the surface, till presently it threatened to touch our faces, and we could not resist the impulse to seize an oar and avert the danger. But the boat would float on, and the boulder descend again, and then we could see that when we had been exactly above it, it must still have been twenty or thirty feet below the surface. Down through the transparency of those great depths, the water was not merely transparent, but dazzlingly, brilliantly so. All objects seen through it had a bright, strong vividness, not only of outline, but of every minute detail, which they would not have had when seen simply through the same depth of atmosphere. So empty and airy did all those spaces seem below us, and so strong was the sense of floating high aloft in nothingness that we called these boat excursions balloon voyages. We fished a good deal, but we did not average one fish a week. We could see trout by the thousands winging about in the emptiness under us or sleeping in shoals on the bottom, but they would not bite. They could see the line too plainly, perhaps. We frequently selected the trout we wanted and rested the bait patiently and persistently 
on the end of his nose at a depth of 80 feet, but he would only shake it off with an annoyed manner and shift his position. We bathed occasionally, but the water was rather chilly, for all it looked so sunny. Sometimes we rowed out to the blue water a mile or two from shore. It was as dead blue as indigo there because of the immense depth. By official measurement, the lake in its center is 1,525 feet deep. Sometimes on lazy afternoons we lolled on the sand in the camp and smoked pipes and read some well-worn novels. At night by the campfire we played euchre and seven-up to strengthen the mind and played them with cards so greasy and defaced that only the whole summer's acquaintance with them could enable the student to tell the ace of clubs from the jack of diamonds. We never slept in our house. It never recurred to us, for one thing, and besides it was built to hold the ground, and that was enough. We did not wish to strain it. By and by our provisions began to run short, and we went back to the old camp and laid in a new supply. We were gone all day and reached home again about nightfall, pretty tired and hungry. While Johnny was carrying the main bulk of the provisions up to our house for future use, I took the loaf of bread, some slices of bacon, and the coffee pot ashore, set them down by a tree, lit a fire, and went back to the boat to get the frying pan. While I was at this, I heard a shout from Johnny and looked up and saw that my fire was galloping all over the premises. Johnny was on the other side of it. He had to run through the flames to get to the lake shore, and then we stood helpless and watched the devastation. The ground was deeply carpeted with dry pine needles, and the fire touched them off as if they were gunpowder. It was wonderful to see with what fierce speed the tall sheet of flame traveled. My coffee pot was gone and everything with it. In a minute and a half the fire seized upon the dense growth of dry manzanita chaparral six or eight feet high, and then the roaring, popping, and crackling was something terrific. We were driven to the boat by the intense heat, and there we remained spellbound. Within half an hour, all before us was a tossing, blinding tempest of flame. It went surging up adjacent ridges, surmounted them, and disappeared in the canyons beyond, burst into view upon higher and farther ridges presently, shed a grander illumination abroad, and dove again, flamed out again, directly higher and still higher up the mountainside, threw out skirmishing parties of fire here and there, and sent them trailing their crimson spirals away among remote ramparts and ribs and gorges, till as far as the eye could reach, the lofty mountain fronts were webbed, as it were, with a tangled network of red lava streams. Away across the water, the crags and dooms were lit with a ruddy glare, and the firmament above was a reflected hell. Every feature of the spectacle was repeated in the glowing mirror of the lake. Both pictures were sublime, both were beautiful, but that in the lake had a bewildering richness about it that enchanted the eye and held it with a stronger fascination. We sat absorbed and motionless through four long hours. We never thought of supper and never felt fatigued, but at eleven o'clock the conflagration had traveled beyond our range of vision and then darkness stole down upon the landscape again. Hunger asserted itself now, but there was nothing to eat. The provisions were all cooked, no doubt, but we did not go to sea. We were homeless wanderers again without any property. Our fence was gone, our house burned down, no insurance. Our pine forest was well scorched, the trees all burned up, and our broad acres of manzanita swept away. Our blankets were on our usual sand bed, however, so we lay down and went to sleep. The next morning we started back to the old camp, but while out a long way from shore, so great a storm came up that we dared not try to land. So I bailed out the seas we shipped, and Johnny pulled heavily through the billows till we had reached a point three or four miles beyond the camp. The storm was increasing, and it became evident that it was better to take the hazard of beaching the boat then go down in a hundred fathoms of water. So we ran in, with tall white caps following, and I sat down in the stern sheets and pointed her head on to the shore. 
The instant the bow struck, a wave came over the stern that washed the crew and cargo ashore and saved a deal of trouble. We shivered in the lee of a boulder all the rest of the day and froze all the night through. In the morning the tempest had gone down and we paddled down to the camp without any unnecessary delay. We were so starved that we ate up the rest of the brigade's provisions and then set out to Carson to tell them about it and ask their forgiveness. It was accorded upon payment of damages. We made many trips to the lake after that and had many a hairbreadth escape and blood-curdling adventure which will never be recorded in any history.